So when you're in a chronic state of parasympathetic dominance, so let's let's talk about, or I'm sorry, of sympathetic dominance as a result of poor choices or bad choices, then all of these things, so what we're looking at here, this diagram is the parasympathetic nervous system's primary functions. Okay, so what are they? Constricts the pupil. Why do we want the pupil constricted? A constricted pupil reduces, oh, let's change colors. Constricted, constricted pupil reduces light. Okay, so it reduces light. When do we want reduced light to the brain? We're trying to sleep, right? This is, again, this is parasympathetic. It's rest, relaxation, sleep, digestion, right? Stimulate salivation. Well, what does that do, right? It's digestion. Saliva has digestive enzymes in it, like amylase, that helps you break down the, the food components. It constricts the bronchi and decreases the heart rate. Okay, so in this case, it, it preps your lungs and your heart for rest. When do we want our lungs to fill with more oxygen and go faster? When do we want our heart rate to go up? When we're in a fight or flight state, when we need our heart and our lungs at full capacity. But when we're at rest, we need these things to be able to relax, right? It stimulates digestive activity. This includes digestive fluids like your stomach acid, your, your, we mentioned earlier your saliva, but your pancreatic digestion as well. So it's very, very important that you, that you stimulate digestive activity when you're trying to eat and that you're not running around in a fight or flight state when you're trying to digest your food. It stimulates the gallbladder. Why is that important? The gallbladder, not only is it, a, is it important for fat absorption, right? Gallbladder produces bile, or rather liver. The, the liver produces bile. The gallbladder secretes bile. The bile emulsifies fat, so it allows you to digest and absorb your fat appropriately. But bile also binds toxins, so it, it, you know, it can be beneficial in that way. And then it inhibits adrenaline. Remember, Fight or flight is you make a lot of adrenaline from your adrenal glands. And this is one of those things, where if you've ever heard the term adrenal fatigue, a lot of people are in adrenal fatigue. And one of the reasons why they're in adrenal fatigue is because they're chronically stuck in fight or flight, right? And so all they're doing is they're making adrenaline. And that's driving their adrenal glands into overreaction. Well, if you can get into parasympathetic mode, you can inhibit that adrenaline, you get to calm down. Remember, what does adrenaline do? It increases anxiety. And so a lot of you, if you, if you struggle with day-to-day -day anxiety and you're not sleeping well and your mind is going 90 to nothing, this is oftentimes, anxiety is a sign of adrenal fatigue in the wings. It's getting ready to happen because you're over-utilizing your adrenal glands. You're riding them too hard because you don't ever come out of that sympathetic tone and you never make it here to this relaxation, right? And so we also get contraction of the bladder. Contraction of the bladder allows you to pee, right? So, so you need to be able to re rela relax um, and then relaxes your rectum so that you can poop, right? And so a lot of people, what do they have? They have constipation and they have shorter bowel transit times. Or rather, I'm sorry, longer bowel transit times. So, so the time that it takes from food to go here, to come out here, right? That transit time is very important. And it should be, you should have a transit time that in effect, where you're pooping one to two times a day as a general rule of thumb, but most people with constipation are pooping every third day. Why? Because their rectum and their muscles, remember your intestinal lining is a series of muscles, of circular muscle, and if they're constantly contracting because you can't relax, then your food will not move through you through the propulsive action of something called peristalsis. And so, very important, we want this to work. Now, why did I go through all this? Because the number one factor involved in regulating this entire system, so if we look at, at this, this here, so what, what feeds your eye, these are what are called cranial nerves. Cranial nerves are the nerves, the specialized nerves that come directly off of your brain. Okay, cranial nerves. And then you have a, what's called cranial nerve 10, which is often, most people have heard of this, the vagus nerve, right? So if you look at, at the vagus nerve, the vagus nerve feeds all of this, right? 
your heart rate, your, your bronchi, or your lungs, your digestion, your gallbladder, your adrenaline, like this is all your vagus, right? And so you hear a lot of people talk about what can you do to stimulate the vagus nerve more, right? What can you do? You can go to bed on time. You can quit eating poison. You can avoid being uh, as much as possible interacting with poisons within the environment because those are the things that put your body in a fight or flight mode and shut off or shut down the vagus nerve. If you want to implement the vagus nerve, you do things like sit, rest, deep breathe, some people use calming oils like lavender. You can use essential oils to, to put the mind in a more calmative state. But being out in nature, um, the Japanese call it forest bathing, but being out in nature, smelling the flowers, you know, strolling, letting the wind blow across your face, these are all things that generally are ra relatively relaxing, right? And so they will activate that vagus nerve and they will stimulate these functions to work better. So well, where we are now in today's society, though, is this part of our nervous system is shut down most of the time and the sympathetic part of our nervous system is in a dominant state and so we have a really hard time doing the things that the sympathetic or the parasympathetic nervous system is supposed to do and again remember choline produces acetylcholine and this is why i wanted you to know all this because acetylcholine is the primary nerve chemical that the nervous system uses, it's your brain and, and your, and your um, cranial nerves use to communicate to all of these things. It's acetylcholine. Without acetylcholine, your brain can try to communicate to these organs, but it won't do it very effectively. You've got to have acetylcholine in order for that to happen. And if you are choline deficient chronically, because you're under stress, because you've chosen stressful things and you've burned through all of your choline and you're not getting enough through your diet, then you will be basically locking yourself into this sympathetic dominant state and locking yourself out of all these wonderful functions, which we don't want. And this is why choline is such an important nutrient. And so how do we get choline? Where does it come from? These are some of your sources as far as gluten-free sources and grain-free sources of choline, right? So the top are, you see these ones up here, your egg and your liver, and you've got other meats like, you know, caviar fish egg, salmon, beef, chicken, and turkey, and then we get to some of the, the plant-based sources. I told you I'd share that with you. So these ones here, right, the shiitake mushrooms, cauliflower, the brassica group of, of vegetables, right, Brussels sprouts and broccoli. Now, here's the thing. Many of you have hypothyroidism, right, and you've been told that you need to limit or reduce your brassica, your cauliflower, your broccoli, your Brussels sprouts because they're goitrogens yet you're still stressed, right? And so this is where it can be really hard on a vegetarian diet if you're trying to limit your exposure to these particular vegetables. Again, goitrogens. That means they interfere with thyroid hormone function. And so if you've already been diagnosed with hypothyroidism and you're trying to follow a vegetarian diet, then really you're left with you know, some shiitake mushrooms, maybe a little bit of iceberg lettuce, but the, the type of choline and iceberg lettuce is not tons of it. It's just a really small amount. So shiitake mushrooms is kind of what you're left with in terms of getting any reasonable quantity, but to really get what your body needs, which is in excess of 600 milligrams a day, um, you're not going to achieve that to any great level here when you're under stress. Uh, and you're, and you're, you know, again, and you're trying to follow a, a plant, solely plant-based diet. Again, just I'm not opposed to a healthy plant-based diet. I just want people that are following it to know where they need to, to to focus their attention for the potential that that diet is the wrong diet for them, or could create problems. So these are again food sources of, of excellent food sources of choline. That being said, let's talk a little bit next about some supplementation um, with choline because some people gravitate toward wanting to supplement and I've seen cases where supplementation was absolutely necessary in order to overcome choline deficit. Food was great, um, but it wasn't enough. And especially if the liver's damaged, if you're in a state of, of liver failure uh, or you're trying to recoup. Now, choline, there are different kinds of choline there's uh, phosphatidylcholine, which I mentioned before. And 
There's um, CTP choline. And then um, there's um, choline bitartrate. We're talking about supplementation here. These are just your um, common ones. And, and so these are probably these three here. These three here are the most common. You know, you go to the, you go to the health food store and you find these three. Now, phosphatidylcholine is generally derived from lecithin, and that lecithin is typically either soy or, or sunflower or um, um, some other type of seed oil. Usually, that's what, what they're generated from. And most of the time, they're not organic, and that, that can pose a problem, especially as it relates to soy, uh, because non-organic soy is, you know, 95% of soy, 90-95% of soy is, is genetically modified and loaded with pesticides, so that would be something you wouldn't really want to take, in my opinion. Um, so that's, you know, your phosphatidylcholine. The, the other problem with this is it's, um, if you've got, let's just say, because it's fat soluble, right? So this is fat. So if you've got, let's say you've had your gallbladder removed. You're not gonna digest it as well. You're not gonna absorb it as well. It may take a little bit longer. And the other thing is it, is it can be challenging to digest. So down in your, in your lower intestine, when it gets down into your colon, the bacteria in the colon can get a hold of that phosphatidylcholine and it can produce something called TMAO. TMAO is a, is a compound that's been linked to certain types of cancers in high amounts. And so in my opinion, phosphatidylcholine is, is not really the best type of choline to take for that reason. It's not that you can't use it, it's not that it can't be helpful, but if you need therapeutic amounts, if you need higher amounts, it's, it's just not going to be the best source for, for absorption and the best source for preventing of this. Um, the, the other form of choline, which, is, which has been marketed mainly for the brain, um, you know, you make choline itself, just pure choline in the body, converts into this brain choline, so to say. And so, you know, the claim here is that this particular type of choline is better if you're struggling with dementia or Alzheimer's. I'm not convinced of that. One of the reasons why is when you're taking this form of choline, it's actually got low percent choline. Most of it is, is, is the carrier molecule. So it's by percentage, it's low quantity of choline. You don't really get a high percentage of choline in that kind of supplement. And then the problem with choline by tartrate is this is corn, uh, derived from corn. And so if you're trying to maintain a, a true gluten-free diet, you don't want choline by tartrate. And by the way, this is the one most supplements contain. And so they won't, they won't tell you that it's, they'll, 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 even on the label, a lot of these products will say gluten-free, but it, you know, by tartrate, this choline by tartrate is definitely a corn derivative. You want to avoid it if you're on a no grain, no pain lifestyle. And so then that, that really leaves us with another form. One of my, it actually is my favorite form, it's choline citrate. And, and one of the reasons why is that when you combine choline with citrate, you get a nice, even, and high dose of choline with a citrate carrier. Citrate is alkalinizing. And so what, what that helps to do is it helps with the pH balance in your cells. But the other thing that choline citrate does very, very well is it helps to increase magnesium absorption and uptake by your cells. So it increases magnesium uptake Choline helps bind and, and, and provide that. So, you know, a lot of people are, are magnesium and intracellularly, they're magnesium deficient as well. And so these two oftentimes go hand in hand where you take choline citrate with magnesium, you get, it's kind of like a twofer. And they both also stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system in a, in a, in a very strong way. So, but the other reason why I like choline citrate is it, it's obviously it's grain free, but it's absorbed through mucosal linings. And so this can be absorbed through the mucosal lining in your stomach. It can be absorbed in your, in your upper small intestine. And so it never really makes it down 
to the colon where those bacteria can convert it into TMAO. So when you take choline citrate in high doses, you don't really have to worry about that chemical right there. And so you don't have to worry about that increased potential. So this, in, in my opinion, is, is why choline citrate, if you're gonna use supplementation, is a superior type of choline. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.